Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the German House for Plant Act, Plants for Climate Action, Growing a Resilient Society. I am Eva Bosbach, the Executive Director of the University of Cologne's North America office here in New York City. Scientific findings, including research results from the University of Cologne in Germany, are the basis for fact-based analysis of climate change and for research-based development of measures to mitigate it. Our goal at the University of Cologne is to make the research findings even more clearly accessible, both in teaching and in dialogue with society by combining research, teaching, and knowledge transfer and working together with our transatlantic and global partners and audiences. The University of Cologne has defined sustainability competencies as one of our quality goals in teaching and studying. We currently have four international liaison offices, one in China, one in India, our newest one in Cairo in Egypt, and ours here in New York. In the New York office, our mission is to present top-notch research from the University of Cologne to the North American audience and connect our researchers to their peers on this side of the Atlantic to discuss issues that are important to all of us. Among our top research areas at the University of Cologne, and some of them you might have been here to events that we have featured them, are aging research, economics, markets and public policy, and matter and light for quantum computing. Today we will discuss plant sciences, which is also one of our core research areas at the University of Cologne. The University of Cologne's cluster of excellence on plant sciences, CEPLAS, is the only research cluster on plant sciences in Germany. And we are excited to he hear about the work of CEPLAS and the new European initiative that they are supporting, Plant Act, Plants for Climate Action. Thank you all for joining us um, today here or online if you are watching the recording and for being part of this important discussion. I would especially like to uh, welcome Director Jamil Ahmad from the United Nations Environment Program New York, who you will be hearing from later today in a keynote. And in the audience, Astrid Jacobs de Padua from the German Embassy in Washington DC, as well as Emanuela Sani of the John Templeton Foundation, whom we thank for their generous support. To conclude, I would like to thank everybody who has made today's event possible. Our fantastic intern, Shion Park. Thank you so much, Shion. And all the other helpers and leaders from the organizations that are co-hosting and co-sponsoring with us tonight. So please welcome to the stage. Christian Hannemann from the Permanent Mission of the Federal Republic of Germany to the UN. Maria de Carvalho from the German Consulate General in New York. <laughs> Georg Bechtold of the German Research Foundation, DFK North America. <laughs> Julia Helms of the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH New York. And Caroline Enger, our pianist, who you have just heard from and will hear from again after our short welcoming round. And while everyone takes their seat, I would just like to thank you all once again for your support. We have a full house tonight with over 250 registrations that we received. So thank you all for being part of this effort. All right, so Christian, there you are. You are the lead for all climate and environment issues at the German Permanent Mission to the UN. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your work at the Permanent Mission. Thank you so much. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be part of this uh, event tonight. And I'm particularly honored that I have this fantastic job where I get to be the um, face of the German government on climate and environment issues to the United Nations community. That is um, all the other member states assembled here in New York, and I'm delighted to um, have seen quite a few of my colleagues on the registration list, but it's also the institutional UN. And Director Ahmad, it's a great honor that you're here tonight. 
and um, you can uh, give us an insight on the important work that UNEP is doing. I really work on everything that is covered by the Rio, found, uh, Rio conventions, for those of you who are versed in that. Um, and uh, that really means I work on issues ranging from biodiversity to desertification to climate and everything that is broadly related. And I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm not an expert, I'm a diplomat, but I've really come to see here in my years in New York, I've been here for almost three years now, how these issues are truly not only the make or break for a natural world, but also for a political world. Because these issues are the ones that will really determine whether we can come together as a global community and find solutions, or if we will drift apart and will not be able to tackle the challenges ahead of us. Because we can only do so together, and we can only do so if it's informed by science. And I keep hearing that from my colleagues, saying, yes, we're happy to have political disagreements, but let's, show, let's make sure we get the science right and we have a strong knowledge base, a strong understanding. I'm very grateful to Eva and all her colleagues for organizing this wonderful two-day workshop and today's night's panel debate to really um, contribute to that important endeavor here at the United Nations in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, and we're happy to have you on board and the mission. Mariela, you are also part of the Federal Foreign Office, but you are the head of cultural affairs and science at the German consulate in New York. So what does tonight's topic mean to you and to the German consulate? Thank you. Um, yeah, so as Christian, I'm also a German diplomat, um, but my work focuses on the bilateral relations between Germany and the US. Um, we're all based here at the German House, which is a privilege that we have the German mission to the UN, the German Consulate General, and then several representatives from German research institutions here. Um, and for us, the science and research cooperation is one of the most relevant aspects of this transatlantic partnership. Um, and we call that science diplomacy. So we are convinced that fostering exchange and collaboration between our two countries um, is essential to develop tools and skills to cope with global challenges like climate change. So for us, it's wonderful to have the university liaison offices, the DVH, DFG, um, the science institutions here uh, in the German house so that we can organize events like today. And as I'm not only head of science, but also cultural affair, I'm very pleased that uh, tonight we can combine these two. And we are very pleased as well. Uh, let me come to Georg. So Georg, the C plus cluster of excellence on plant sciences that I have mentioned is funded by the German Research Foundation. Thank you very much. As the director of the research, um, German Research Foundation North America offices, can you maybe tell us about the mission of the German Research Foundation? How is the DFG connected to this topic? How is the DFG connected to C plus? Well, it's not connected at all to C plus. Um, let me say it that way. Um, we did not. We we haven't decided to fund C plus due to the fact that plant science was missing in the excellence initiative. C plus is funded to one single reason. That's because these people are excellent. They convinced our international review board and our our decision bodies. So that's the single reason. Um, yeah. How much time do I have to present DFG? <laughs> One or two, I was prepared for 30 minutes. Anyway, so I give you the ultra short version. Um, DFG, German Research Foundation, is uh, comparable to the National Science Foundation here in the US and also to NIH as we fund uh, medicine, medical research as well, and also NEH or, the, or SSRC as we fund also humanities. And as I just mentioned, we don't have thematical priorities, so in principle, any researcher in Germany, any German-based researcher, can submit any application to any subject in science and humanities to DFG and is, uh, in case, sometimes they are successful and they are funded. Um, yeah, our budget is uh, 3.5 billion euros per year and um, we, we get it from the federal and the state governments, but in our decisions we are independent and it's just science or excellence that counts. I guess these were my three minutes. Thank you very much.
Yeah, and it's great. Just the excellent signs. Fantastic. Julia, as the program officer of the German Center of Research and Innovation, DWH New York, you have organized a lot of events and some of us um, bid us together, which we are very thankful for. So can you tell us briefly about the DWH New York and maybe also the annual motto that you have this year, resilience in society that we proudly use in our co-title? Sure. Oh, it's on. So for those of you who don't know, the German Center for Research in New York is one of six global centers worldwide that works to promote the work of German researchers and bring them together with other experts around the world. The New York office has 25 different supporters, and they represent cumulatively over 40 different German research institutions. So we are absolutely delighted that today, CEPLES and the event here is promoting the work of two of our supporters, which is the University of Cologne and also the German Research Foundation. Aoife was so kind to mention our annual topic, which is in the title of this event, The Resilient Society. Through events like tonight's and other programming, the DVH works to address the issue of resilience, bringing together interdisciplinary experts. And this year, anybody in New York City on October 20th is cordially invited to our annual conference, the Future Forum, which will explore resilience from topics including climate change, as well as global, uh, governance, security, and other issues. So you're all invited to join us there. And I want to do a quick shout out to my colleague, David, who is in the back there helping out. We are more than happy to talk to you later after the event. So if you have any questions about the German Center for Research, please approach us. And uh, Caroline, so thank you so much for the wonderful interlude on the piano, which is part of Resonating Earth, correct? It was wonderful to see and hear how you connect uh, music and media with this important topic. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about Resonating Earth, the piece you played and the projection that we saw, and also about the piece we will hear next, which is Wolfgang Riem's Auf einem anderen Blut. So um, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Uh, <laughs> beyond honored. So um, my project, Resonating Earth, it, um, it's a multimedia project as you Experience. The piece that I played was a prelude by Bach. So I'll describe my resonating earth project. From the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico to coal burning plants in the Ruhr Valley of Germany. From the glorious heights of mountain ranges in Alaska to mountains of potassium waste in eastern Germany. Resonating earth was created in response to the climate crisis with a wide range of ambient music, including Bach, Wolfgang Riem, Missy Mazzoli, Philip Glass, Marcos Balter, Iman Habibi, and Caroline Shaw, alongside stunning imagery of the environment by Peabody Award-winning producer Elliot Forrest from WQXR, and visual artist Miles Aronowitz, and internationally exhibited environmental activist and photographer J. Henry Fair. Resonating Earth creates a soundscape focusing on the beauty in our environment and inspires environmental activism in an artistic, musically immersive way. So I don't know, I mean, given my, my clock here, I don't know if I need to go too much into describing the Bach prelude in C major from the Well-Tempered Clavier. So I'm so glad that many of you are familiar with him and know his music. Um, I'll give you a quote from the video artist, J. Henry Fair, and what he wrote, because he is a, um, a co-collaborator with me, and unfortunately he was not able to be here this evening. Um, his quote about this projection was, Bach was from Eisenach on the Hörsel River, which joins the Vera River, just at the site of this giant potash mine, which is polluting this river just a few miles from Bach's home. I can imagine the young Bach fishing and swimming in this very spot, and the youngsters today who cannot. So, um, Henry's a character. <laughs> so, and then um, I will then go on to the ream, which you'll see in a little while. Okay, um, first of all, I want to say that the performance of the ream, reams Auf einem anderen Blatt, or On Another Leaf, is the New York City premiere performance of this piece. And his birthday is on the 13th of this month, so. Um, 
He composed it for Pierre Boulez's 75th birthday, and the premiere took place at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Um, he's uh, from Karlsruhe. He's teaching there at the university and has an institute of new music and media. I think, um, again, given time, I will skip ahead to Henry's quote about the work, uh, about his visuals. Um, you'll find that Henry, uh, Wolfgang Riem's music is very atmospheric and kind of, um, I don't know, it pushes some boundary, uh, it pushes some lines in terms of musical composition and I would welcome any kind of conversation you'd like to have afterwards with me. This is from J. Henry Fair, once again, the video creator. Wolfgang Riem is from Karlsruhe on the Rhine River, one of the most important shipping routes in the world and the site of the tremendous brown coal fields just upriver. These coal mines are the largest source of carbon in Europe, as well as more toxic pollution than we can name. Karlsruhe is also the seat, a seat of democracy and jurisprudence, being the home of the first German parliament and the highest courts. The Hambach mine is a profoundly undemocratic and unjust enterprise, forcing people from their homes and dooming our future. But it is also the source of hope. In 2018, 50,000 Europeans demonstrated against the expansion of the mine and the courts supported them. These brown coal images from Hambach are the past and the present. Auf einem anderen Blatt makes me think there is a different future. Okay, so this gives us something to think about and I hope you feel inspired and maybe you want to talk to people later and research some things. With this, I would like to conclude this short welcoming round. Thank you all so much for introducing your work and your organizations and most importantly, thank you for supporting and co-organizing this event with us tonight. It would not have been possible without you and uh, the support of the John Templeton Foundation. Thank you again also for that. And we will now move away from the stage and Caroline, the f uh, floor and air will be yours uh, for your second piece. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Caroline, for this inspiring music that is so well connected to our topic tonight. It is now my honor to welcome to the stage Shamil Ahmad, <coughs> Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at the United Nations Environment Program, New York, for his keynote address. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished guests. I'm really honored and excited to be um, present here this evening to talk to you on this important uh, subject. And I'm thankful to uh, the University of Cologne, New York office, the permanent mission of Germany to the United Nations, the Consulate General of uh, Germany in New York, and all other partners uh, who have made this uh, here today for the European Initiative Plant Act, uh, the new one, and the chapter of North America, which is being inaugurated here. For those of you uh, who may not be uh, familiar with UNEP, or the United Nations Environment Program, uh, we are the, considered as the global authority on environment, uh, which sets the global environmental agenda by doing a number of things, uh, producing reports, assessments, uh, a global uh, environmental legislative body called the United Nations Environment Assembly. And uh, among other things, we focus on increasing ambition, building broad-based support and partnerships for transformational change for sustainable development. So our topic today uh, is of utmost importance. We live in a world which is falling short of Paris climate goals, where progress to reach SDGs is slow and off the track in most of the cases, and where previous targets on biodiversity we have missed. Only an urgent transformation center on the latest science can avoid a climate disaster. Allow me to remind ourselves, we are witnessing dangerous disruption across the natural world. Species are migrating, including humans, in search of more livable conditions, or just getting extinct. In climate risk hotspots, deaths from floods, droughts, storms, were 15 times higher than those in resilient countries over the last decade. Just look at just look for the last year's floods in Pakistan, where 30 million people were displaced, 33 billion cost to economy. Recent floods in South Africa, in New Zealand, and many other parts of the world, where these environmental disasters are becoming more intense, more frequent. And, dis and, and disrupting life and livelihoods on large scale. Let me reflect also on the contribution of nature-based solutions to climate action. The United Nations Environment Assembly, as I just mentioned, in March 2022, last year, agreed on a definition of nature-based solution. And I quote this definition, actions to protect, conserve, restore, sustainably use and manage natural or modified terrestrial, freshwater, coastal and marine ecosystems, which address social, economic, environmental challenges effectively and adoptively, while simultaneously providing human well-being, ecosystem services, and resilience and biodiversity benefits." Unquote. Distinguished guests, the road to a consensus on this definition was not easy. We still have a lot more work to do to develop common priorities, and UNEP can be a catalyst in that respect. That is why Plant Act, is, this initiative, is so relevant. Plant science-based solutions, which are part and parcel of the nature-based solutions, can create jobs, stable livelihoods, while addressing the urgent challenges of climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. NBS on nature-based solutions are easily available, but do not require a lot more, but do require a lot more financial support. The challenge of financing for climate and biodiversity has also been discussed in recent COP meetings on climate in Sharm el-Sheikh and biodiversity in Montreal. 
natural climate solutions can provide up to 37% of climate mitigation needed for Paris Agreement and can do so cost effectively. However, the world is still underperforming on tripling investments in NBS from current levels to by 2030 if we are to meet the Rio Convention's target, particularly keeping the global warming under uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, halting biodiversity loss and, and, and halting also land degradation. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, nature-based solutions are cost-effective and proven. At the UN, the UN system is playing its part by using its convening power to support ambitions and transformative actions on nature. The decade of ecosystem restoration, which runs from 2021 to 2030, and turning the tide on deforestations are some of the initiatives that can contribute to the SDGs, ensure food security, and address climate change. We need to scale up initiatives like these, because when we give nature a chance, we have a better shot at achieving the SDGs and, most importantly, reducing poverty. SDG 1 is reducing poverty and it was not without reason that SDG 1 was declared as aimed at poverty. We cannot afford to lose more time. To turbocharge our efforts, the UN Secretary General will convene the SDG Summit in September which will be preceded by the high-level political forum in July here at the UN headquarters. Plant science and nature-based solutions are central to the success of these efforts. So we welcome the discussions here today and tomorrow under the auspices of Plant Act. Scientific advancements are showing us how the world's plants may offer long-term viable solutions not only to the problems caused by climate change, but also potential solutions to climate change itself. For instance, in the agriculture sector, we are, seeing the emergence of, we, we are seeing the emergence every day of new research and new technologies. Crop protection products and biotech crops have emerged as critical to mitigating problems associated with climate change. These plant science tools are significantly reducing the impact of agriculture on the environment and of climate change on the agriculture. But these solutions and tools will also require major investments in scientific research and technological development. Across all regions, scientists, some of you are present here, are pioneering the way and providing us with solid evidence on which we need to base our discussions in intergovernmental forum in, in, in the UN and elsewhere. This work will help us apply what we can learn from natural systems to move towards climate resiliency. In conclusion, distinguished guest, one of the best ways of addressing climate crisis and enhancing resilience is through, be is through be backing nature. The important work of all of you to contribute to nature-based solutions cannot be overemphasized. Governments must also now align their efforts and commit to investing in nature as part of their national policies and approaches. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of work left to do to provide sustainable solutions towards addressing the climate crisis, to reducing poverty, and to research emanating out of Plant Act initiative must guide this work. I think I thank you all for this opportunity here this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Ahmad, for addressing us tonight and explaining uh, the role of the UN and of UNEP connected uh, to our topic. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Yena Kwon to you who will be taking over from me as the moderator for the rest of the evening. Jena is a freelance journalist reporting for the German public broadcasters ZDF and WDR. And what is special about her to us is that not only she's born in Cologne, Germany, but she also received both her master's degrees and PhD from the University of Cologne. So that's actually one thing that really <laughs> truly connects the two of us, dear Jena. 
Currently, Jena is a visiting research fellow at Harvard University, and we are honored uh, to have you as our moderator. So please welcome Jena to the stage. And I would also like to invite the distinguished plant scientist uh, to join us. That's going to be Stan Kopřiva from the University of Cologne and the CEPLAS. <laughs> Harry Bert here from the Plant Act Initiative. <laughs> Joe and Corey from the Salk Institute. Cynthia Gleason from Washington State University. And Svenja Augustin from the CEPLAS Cluster of Excellence on Plant Science. Thank you so much, Eva, for the wonderful introduction. And um, I feel truly honored to be invited to this event and to be part of such a wonderful panel with um, plant experts, scientists. And as Eva already said, I feel honored because I'm an alumni, uh, alumna of the University of Cologne myself. And as you all know, the University of Cologne with um, the New York office here in this building uh, with Eva Basbach as the executive director is the main organizer of this event. So I can promise to you that the next 40, roughly 40 to 45 minutes are going to be packed full with science and hopefully lots of inspiring ideas for you as well. No matter if you are a scientist, a plant scientist, or just a normal human being like myself <laughs> who is simply interested in fighting climate change. So. Uh, I just want to uh, remind you already now that if you have questions coming up, please do me a favor and remember them or maybe take even notes because afterwards we're going to have a Q&A. And as a journalist myself, I really want to make sure that no question remains unanswered in this room. So let's just dive in. Um, Stan, I want to uh, start off with you, Stan Capriva. You are the deputy speaker of the Cluster of Excellence on Plant Science called C plus at the University of Cologne. You came all the way from my hometown, Cologne, and um, as a Cologne person, I can tell it's the best city of the world. <laughs> sorry, New York, sorry, Boston, but um, Stan, why are we exactly here in the German house in New York City today? Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, we are here because um, University of Cologne is uh, the grounding, grounding member of, of uh, C plus um, in Cologne and Düsseldorf, um, and we became really the center for uh, plant science in in Germany and one of the biggest centers in um, Europe actually, and um, that shows the importance of plant science. We want to uh, present our result and our mission research in, in plants towards uh, mitigating of uh, climate change and uh, security to a, a broader audience. And uh, what a better place than, uh, than Manhattan, than the uh, office of the University of Cologne and the German house here. So yeah, we are here. And maybe you can shortly, for all the people who don't know exactly what C plus is, maybe you can shortly summarize the core concept of this excellent initiative. Okay, so um, the Center of uh, Excellence in Plant Sciences, C+, is um, uh, funded by the uh, German Research Council, as uh, you heard before. We are the only green cluster uh, in plant sciences, and uh, our mission is uh, to approach the uh, global challenges uh, in food security and, and climate change through excellent research uh, on plant biology. Uh, through training of a uh, new generation of uh, plant scientists and also actually to engage with the society. That's why we are here again um, in this uh, public debate. And uh, our scientific vision is uh, predictive breeding, to be able to um, change plants, to uh, make plants uh, better adapted to, to specific environments and to uh, ensure uh, better yields quality of uh, um, output for future. Maybe 
Before I go into a more detailed question, a more general one, why are you, as a human being, so interested in plants? What fascinates you about the species? <laughs> well, plants are a source of, of our food, uh, of our clothing, of uh, almost uh, everything that we touch in, uh, in everyday life. There would be no life without plants. We would have uh, no oxygen to breathe. Uh, um, and it would be, a, you know, even if, if we would somehow manage it, it would be a very sad life without plants, I think. So, uh, of course, I'm fascinating and uh, fascinated by, by plants. And also, you know, they are actually much more clever than we, than we think. And, and once uh, we start to understand them better and observe them better, we see how clever they are. Uh, even without, without brain, that's sometimes mm -hmm. a great uh, ways of, uh, of dealing with uh, uh, Now, as I promised, a more uh, slightly more detailed question. Your research aims to find solutions to capture and store the excess CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, mineral nutrients play a decisive role, you say. And now please explain to me why nutrients, because when I personally think of nutrients, I think of vitamins, I think of proteins, um, but uh, what does, what kind of role does it play in this context? So I'm asking maybe on behalf of all the people who don't know so much about plant science. Um, okay, so um, the building blocks of, of life are made not only from, uh, from carbon and, and oxygen, but also from minerals like uh, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. Um, these nutrients are absolutely essential for everything that's uh, Organisms. Um, a lot of the reactions or uh, processes that um, are necessary for capture of, of uh, light energy and photosynthesis in plants and capture of CO2 and its assimilation and uh, um, require not only these three minerals but many other minerals like uh, iron, manganese, zinc um, in order to, to, to finish these reactions. And this is sometimes a little bit neglected when one, when one thinks about plant biology. CO2 is, is always the, the major nutrient and the major issue. But uh, without all these nutrients, we actually wouldn't be able to capture not a single gram of CO2. Thank you, Stan, uh, for your explanations that I even understood. Um, <laughs> your excellence cluster has also played a crucial role in founding Plant Act exclamation mark. Um, so Harry Bert, I wanted to uh, move on to you talking about the title of the event that we can, oh, not at the moment, but before that, you could see um, on the slide, plant act exclamation mark. So yeah, let's stick with um, the small details here. Can you please explain me what this exclamation mark means in this context? Because it makes all the difference. So what makes plant act exclamation mark, so different from other initiatives? Okay, I think uh, the explanation mark actually means action, that we have to get to work, and that we can't work, wait for long periods of time because the time is actually running out. Um, and I think it also means that a lot of people got together uh, on a meeting last year and said, we, plant scientists have to do something in a coordinated way. We have to develop concepts. Um, so the idea of Plant Act is really to function as a think tank um, that then spans out, goes to, to include other experts that are needed and uh, make this not only a European movement, it started in Europe, that's true, but that's also why we are now here in, in the US. We want to uh, you know, join our colleagues and in, invite them to, to join this initiative. And actually, we are already going global. So we have now already um, 33 ambassadors in different countries all over the world uh, to, to make this um, initiative, I think, going global. Um, in this case, I think it's also very clear that what we need is to work together with people from uh, everywhere on this planet, of all colors, of all ideas, because we really need uh, the input f 
from from all regions. Their problems are very different um, sometimes, and we don't know everything, and we have to also learn from other people. You just mentioned it's kind of a think tank, so I can imagine Plant Act is a group of people, of plant scientists, of experts who all share the same research interest in fighting global climate change uh, through plants. Is it just one field or is it a broader field, plant science? Okay, so I think the realizing that agriculture is uh, a major contributor to, to climate uh, problem, climate crisis, uh, we have a, currently about one-fourth uh, of all greenhouse gases are produced by agriculture. Um, and if we continue the same track in agriculture to, to 2050, we will increase that to up to 40%. Uh, that, that's absolutely impossible that we continue on this, on this road. So we have to do something uh, against this, avoid this, but at the same time, I think it's also realizing that agriculture and plant science is, can be the, the best way not only to stop this, but also to, to actually mitigate. That means to capture uh, greenhouse gases back and reduce them. So I think we are in, a, in the driver's seat and if we don't act now, we will actually only see the consequences. And not only we, I'm speaking about my children and especially my grandchildren, because this is the, uh, what we are actually going to leave them on this planet and they will ask us, why didn't you act? <laughs> Elibet, you study plants and you study in hot deserts, right? Um, this sounds actually uh, quite what an interesting combination to my ears, but maybe can you elaborate on this? Um, why plants in hot deserts and what does it ex exactly mean for Plant Act? Okay, I was born in a desert in Iran. Um, I grew up in Germany and then I lived in, in South Africa and in, in Namibia, which is also one of the biggest deserts in the world. And um, so I think I'm, I'm kind of primed on, on deserts in some way. <laughs> and uh, I've always been fascinated. I mean, then becoming a plant scientist, uh, I'm learning and studying how plants can grow and being exposed to climate change. That means realizing that water and temperatures are major uh, factors that are limiting actually the productivity. Um, I was just fascinated how plants can live in a desert and have rainfall once a year. So this, uh, and when, when I got now the possibility actually to study this in really in a, with a large group of people, um, I accepted this position to go to Saudi Arabia, set up a lab there. And um, I must say we made incredible discoveries that wouldn't have been possible from, uh, you know, in, 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 in Europe where I was beforehand. I think the great thing is that um, we are here to kind of present this Plant Act initiative to the American audience here and see how we can reach partners here. But at the same time, we're also here to learn more about what's happening here in the US. And of course, we also have uh, extinguished panelists here from the United States. Um, Joanne Chori, uh, I'm so glad to meet you in person. The last time we spoke to each other, that was on Zoom. And um, that was already, I was quite thrilled by your work when we just talked uh, on Zoom and now we're here. <laughs> um, Joanne, you're one of the pioneers in this field. Um, and as the title suggests, um, you think we can actually fight climate change with plants, which sounds like amazing in my ears. Um, but this shows you're truly dedicated to kind of shift public awareness in the, U in the US as well um, to, to plants in the context of climate change. How new would you say is this concept to the American people? Because um, we are also here to kind of build bridges and to learn from each other. I think the, right now the United States is really 
very focused on climate change as a major problem. But for me, the wake up call was happened in 2014, actually. And what happened in 2014 was that, you know, the postdocs and graduate students at my institute asked us, a couple of us plant scientists, to tell them about climate change and what were the problems. And we realized we didn't really know that much about it, but we did our homework and we gave a lecture, right? And in the course of my lecture, I stood there in front of you know, 300 PhD level life scientists, and I said, where does the mass of this tree come from? And they all said, uh, water on the ground, you know, um, soil, you know, and nobody, no one there said, it comes from CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, and they had all forgotten what photosynthesis was, because in California, the last time you see photosynthesis is fifth grade. And then that's it, right? You're out of there. So anyways, and so I was really depressed by that because I said to my colleague, I said, if we can't motivate this group of people, how am I going to explain like the real complexity of climate change? Because it's very complex math that goes behind all these climate extremes and stuff. And so, yeah, so I guess, I, so I've been awake about it for like the last nine years or whatever, but I think most of the United States didn't really become aware that how bad the climate situation was until it hit them in their backyards, right? Yeah. So that's been the last year or so, or two. Yeah. You've talked a lot about Plant Act um, at the beginning, but uh, Joanne, you have your own initiative, which is called the Silk Harnessing Plant Initiative. What do you exactly want to achieve with it? And we have an initiative called Harnessing Plants Initiative. And in that initiative, what we're trying to do is sequester, we're, we're trying to make crop plants, you know, the major crops that feed the world, um, into better carbon sequesterers as well. So we want to give them a new function, basically. So we're collect, we're, what we're doing is, um, and I'm doing this with my colleague, Wolfgang Bush, who's right, right over there, who talked in the expert session this afternoon. But um, yeah, so what we're trying to do is, is think about what traits would, would a plant that could sequester more, more carbon have to have, right? And so um, we decided those were root traits mostly. And so we're looking for plants that make bigger roots and they make deeper roots because the amount of soil carbon that can be accumulated is higher when it's deeper. So we need plants that make deeper roots, and we also need plants that redistribute some of their sugars into polymers, which are much more stable. So that we're going to ask the plant to bury those polymers deep in the ground for us. There aren't, aren't many microbes, and then, um, and then uh, that's it. <laughs> Hopefully, Go ahead, can you give us some of that? Can you give us carbon. an example? about what kind of plants are we talking? Is it a plant that I can have in my own garden or are these very... We do this with any plant, I think. But we don't want to do this with any plant because that's too hard for a, group, a small group of people to do. So what we're, what we're doing it with is the six most prevalent crops on the earth. And these crop plants, these six species, um, occupy half of all the world's arable land. So all we have to do is get good at six types of plants. You know, there's 400,000 species of plants on the earth. They really have, they have a broad expansion, right? And so, but I like this, I like this project because anybody can, if, they, if you were really dedicated to transforming a sunflower thing or whatever, you could do it. Garden clubs could do it, you know. Church groups could do it. You know, they need to give you seed to, you know, Home Depot or whatever, and they'll sell it. And so, I mean, it, it all becomes a whole economy. And so, I like it. And it made me get more involved in my science, I think. But it also really gets people excited, you know. So my, my, my little group of people I like to go talk to are garden clubs. I go to garden clubs and I tell them about sequestering carbon, right? And, and it, it's very exciting for these women, and mostly women in garden clubs. I'm not being a sexist or anything. But anyway, you know, um, these women are all very excited about doing that. 
And so, you know, I have a colleague in San Diego, he's where I'm from. He goes to church groups because he thinks they always listen to their pastor or whoever. And so he tries to get that guy, a woman on board, and then they go and they get the whole pass and I feel involved. So I mean, I think it is all hands on board. What we've been saying already here tonight. You know, everybody has to this thing is the thing you hate to do, like dishes, right? Just quit doing them, right? Quit doing dishes because you now have to go and plant some trying to sequestering plants. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. I know, right. So you really love plants, and I'm sure your students do as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Joanne, uh, for your dedication to plant science. And we also have another scientist here from the U.S., all the way from Washington State, not from Washington, D.C., as I learned uh, this evening. Um, so nice to meet you here. Um, your research looks on a very, very interesting field um, that I personally didn't really uh, connect to plant science when I first heard it. You look at organisms in the ground, such as the small roundworms that inhabit soils all over the world. And I think you scientists call it nematodes, nematodes? Yes, yes nematodes. Oh, yes, I can now <laughs> geek out in front of friends well, next time when I'm talking about roundworms. Um, anyway, how does your research relate to climate mitigation? OK, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm a person here who, um, when they say you have your head in the sand, um, to me that's not really a negative connotation, because I actually do have my head in the soil. And I'm looking at the, the roundworms that live in the soil. Um, so you might be surprised if you pick up a handful of soil. These microscopic worms are there. There could be hundreds or thousands. You wouldn't know it uh, just by looking at it, but they're there. And they're part of the soil community. They're part of soil health. Um, so my research focuses a lot on plant parasitic nematodes. Um, and in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, we grow a lot of potatoes. Over 50% of the potatoes grown in the United States are from this region. So you're looking at a picture of me and some of my colleagues looking at a potato plant. And um, you know, potatoes are very susceptible to nematodes. Uh, the nematodes will enter into the tubers and cause them to be all lumpy and bumpy. So, um, you know, they're perfectly edible, but people don't want to eat blemished potatoes. So part of my research is developing new tools of resistance to nematodes. And that includes genetically modifying potatoes. It includes traditional breeding. But the bottom line is we want to generate new tools so that growers do not have to rely on chemical controls. It's all about sustainable agriculture. Um, so nematodes are a pathogen, but some nematodes are actually quite beneficial to the soil. And you know, if you think about soil, it's a living organism. It's, it's breathing, it has these organisms, it has nematodes, bacteria, fungi, and all together, they are a community that contributes to soil health. And we're studying nematodes as well as part of the soil health. They can sequester uh, carbon. They can help uh, mineralize nitrogen so that it's more accessible to the plant. And so all these aspects lead to sustainable agricultural practices and greater plant productivity with a reduction in input. So my research is directed towards sustainable agriculture and um, yeah, climate mitigation. Talking about agriculture, in your work you talk to farmers a lot, you said. Um, super interesting, which I find. Uh, do you get a sense that they're concerned about climate change or what do you think will motivate farmers to take actions that will actually reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, so I do talk to growers. I especially talk to potato growers, but other growers as well. And, you know, growers consider themselves stewards of the environment. And they are interested in um, maintaining soil health and protecting the environment. But they have um, a bottom line. There's very little profit margin in agriculture. And so growers are concerned about uh, making money. And I think, <laughs> as a lot of people are, but, um, and I think that if 
There was public acceptance of GMOs that would help reduce a reliance on chemical controls that are not only expensive but harmful. Um, they would also be very willing to use these new biotech, uh, you know, new tools that they have available to help uh, control pathogens, to help plants grow better, and to make everything a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, so I think it's important to understand the social pressures and the policies that we have at the moment that may uh, prevent adoption of some of these new tools that farmers can use to help mitigate uh, climate change and greenhouse emissions. Um, you said you talk a lot to farmers and you travel probably a lot around the U.S. Um, well, at least in the, the Pacific Northwest, yes. <laughs> Northwest. Is there a specific, I, I can imagine, I'm not an expert, but I can imagine that the soil in one region is totally different from other regions. Is there a region that particularly interests you as a plant scientist? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I'm actually part of a larger initiative for potato growers all over the country, because you're right, the soil is different. The soil health and the microbiome and the communities in the soil are very different, but we're trying to find commonalities as well so that we can advise growers as to the best methods forward for their particular environment. Thank you so much. I learned a lot about roundworms potatoes. <laughs> and um, the thing is, while we're talking a lot about plant science or um, uh, potato, uh, potatoes, pathogens, exactly, um, we should not forget the bigger picture. We're actually always uh, tackling or trying to tackle climate change. That's the context, um, which poses an immediate threat, um, an existential threat, actually, to our future. And the generation that is most affected by it is the younger people, um, children, babies that are not yet born. Um, Svenja, you as a young scientist, uh, you have decided to dedicate your profession and your time to this. You have even co-created the initiative, um, hashtag give genes a chance. I love this uh, name already. Um, as you all know, hashtags are uh, designed to reach a bigger audience and probably also more younger people. Um, you are yourself an early career researcher and you're quite engaged in science communications, um, which is also quite important in the whole context when we talk about research, science, how to actually convey it to um, the public out there. Uh, why do you think it is important to engage in these activities um, in your free time? Well, I'm really, really happy and grateful to be invited to this panel today, and it's my first time abroad, so uh, I'm experiencing the U.S. for the first time. It's really nice here. Um, yeah, uh, science communication. It was actually, um, I, I always liked um, political activism, and uh, in the U.P. There is uh, a lot of political debate about genome editing and GMOs in, uh, in plant breeding, for example. And I felt that this is super important and in my opinion, there were many misinformation uh, floating around uh, surrounding this topic and uh, as an early career researcher, I felt that it was get more information out there into the general public, but also <coughs> towards uh, policy makers and stakeholders in this entire process of plant breeding, agriculture, and in the bigger picture, also climate change, <coughs> because genetic engineering is one of the most important tools we can apply for plant breeding to, for once, climate-proof our agriculture, but also as the Plant Act initiative now one uh, tries to uh, communicate, I also use plants as tools to mitigate climate change and sequester carbon into the soil again. What are key experiences you've made in um, the public science communications efforts? So it is important to talk to varying audiences and to reach as many parts of the society as possible. However, general broadcasting um, 
formats like TV appearances, are, while they are helpful and uh, help to uh, raise public awareness for plant sciences in my case, as scientists, we have the most, Im the largest impact in our direct community. So it is not an, it is not a secret for people who research communication, for example, that if we that we have the biggest impact on people who trust us. So when I talk to my family or my friends who are not in plant sciences, and they are more likely to adapt my point of view on plant sciences, on climate change, on agriculture, just for the simple fact that they trust me. So do not only engage in public and broadcasting, broad Try to communicate communicate in your own communities and your own societal circles because that's where you have a lot of impact. So everyone can can be a science communicator at whatever scale. Joanne just mentioned that um, public awareness in the U.S. Um, has grown in terms of showing interest uh, for topics around climate change. Uh, where do you think, um, as someone who is very invested in uh, science communications, where do we stand in Germany or also maybe globally in the, f in the field of plant science? How well known is it or do we have to do more to make it more public? I think plant sciences unfortunately are often overlooked. Um, that is due to something that is called generally referred as plant blindness. If we show a picture with a plant and a bee in on the picture to someone and uh, ask them to point out biological organisms like life, they will in most cases point at the bee but do not recognize the plant. And the plant is just as much alive as, as the bee is. Uh, so. Plants are really, really cool. Actually, uh, when I first started with my undergraduate studies, I had no, had no plans of going into plant sciences because I much rather wanted to do something useful, so I wanted to do <laughs> biomedical research. But uh, then I found out that plant sciences um, inter interact with plant breeding efforts Plant breeding and agriculture are directly connected to agriculture. Agriculture is the basis for our food and also our clothing, for example. And plants have this dual role. They are affected by, climate, by the effects of climate change, like more, drought, more droughts, flooding, extreme climate uh, uh, conditions. But on the other hand, they are also part of the solution because they have this amazing technology of photosynthesis that takes, photo, uh, takes carbon dioxide and puts it back into the soil. Thank you so much, Svenja. Before we move on to the Q&A, I just want to give our panelists our last chance to uh, wrap up the panel and um, to maybe uh, give us a last thought that we can ruminate about later on uh, at the reception or maybe even tonight when we sleep. Um, to make it a bit easier for you, I just want to ask you a very simple, short question. Um, and I uh, ask you to keep it short and spicy. Um, why now? Why do, do you think that really is important that we have to act now? And maybe as a bonus info, I would be very interested if you could tell me what is your favorite plant? Thank you. <laughs> Okay, right now, I think I said it already. I think it's almost, uh, it's almost, it's five minutes to 12 uh, that we have to act and that uh, we need to do that together. We have to, we cannot, not, not a single person can do it. And that, that is really also why I think Plant Act uh, needs uh, uh, the, the initiative to go from Europe to the US and, and further. So that is, that is really the, we have to get together all the experts around one table and we also have to get around the, 
the the funding agencies and we have to speed up the process of like getting uh, ideas to into solutions uh, this is a process that takes too long at the moment and we don't have time and uh, we also have to change I think our scientific culture we have to become we say when when there is a, a big risk you also have to take risks that means we have to look whether some solutions that seem to be you know quite improbable uh, that we cannot make them happen so I think we have to, to act and my my <clears throat> favorite plant is actually um, called Calotropis um, that is a plant that grows in the desert and it's a big it's a big bush I uh, cannot even be several meters high um, it it's right there in the desert um, has big leaves is always green and um, there's no water so I'm I just <laughs> don't know how this plant does it and that is, the plant <laughs> and, uh, it seems impossible, but it does it. So this is my favorite plant. Perfect. Thank you. Joanne, maybe? Okay. Um, what was the first question? Uh, why do we have to act now? We have to act now because we can act now. And I don't think plant biology was ready to take on a big challenge like this until very recently. In the last 30 years, we figured out how plants grow in different con contexts and things like that. So I, I think it kind of behooves us, as I say, you know, that we should work on this. That's something I didn't want to do at the end of my career. And I, you know, so that's what I'm doing. Your favorite plant? My favorite species of plant. It's daffodils. I love daffodils. But my favorite plant is my Chinese magnolia, who's been on in the wrong time zone since whenever I first got it. And now it's totally screwed up, right? Because of climate change. <laughs> <laughs> screwed up because of climate change. Okay. okay. Then? Okay, by, by now, um, one reason is we can all see the effects of climate change uh, through all the catastrophes that were mentioned before and uh, I think it's a global issue. Second reason is, as Jean said, we can, we have, we have the tools now. Uh, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, we can do it. And uh, why do uh, we start as an initiative? Because we can't do it alone. We really need to join efforts and do this uh, in, a, in a big group and, uh, and globally. And my favorite plant? Metal. Metal. Because that's my name in Czech. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so why now? Well, if we think back a couple of years ago, we had a, a huge crisis with COVID, and scientists from around the world came together and developed a vaccine in a relatively short amount of time, and it was amazing. And I think plants and um, climate change are becoming also a critical issue, and we now have the um, scientists coming together from around the world. We have the technology, and I think we also have the will. We just need maybe a little bit more uh, funding, easier funding mechanisms, but now is the time. And my favorite plant is tomato because they're really hard to kill, uh, no matter how much I try uh, to kill them. <laughs> Sounds brutal. <laughs> well, maybe I don't try to kill them, but you know. <laughs> they're very hard to kill. We need to act now because I would like to have a livable planet by the time I get 60. That would be great. Um, I think it is uh, the perfect time to actually engage and um, uh, collaborate to get the tools on the table and get our plants working together to tackle climate change. My favorite plant is actually the plant I work with. It's a Habidopsis thaliana, Thalecress. Uh, it's very tiny. It's uh, also impossible to kill. That's why I like it a lot. Uh, that's why I work with it. It's uh, impossible to kill. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's, let's give our panelists a warm applause. Now I want to invite you all in the room to raise your questions and please do remember there is no such thing as 
a stupid question because we're all here to learn from each other. Okay, I can already see the first ones. Thank you. My name is Arturo Garcia Coso. I'm a, a program officer with, the, with New York Community Trust for the local, national, international environment. So the world has very quickly uh, embraced the concept of net zero as a, a goal or an approach to, to address climate change, to try to stabilize the climate system. But on one end of the political spectrum, there's many people that are criticized net zero as being, frankly, too little, too, too late, and we really need to be in a net negative uh, stance. Uh, but what I would like you to speak to, one of the critiques coming of, of net zero is that they're focusing too much on the kind of one-to-one -one, uh, accounting between a, 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 a ton of carbon dioxide uh, emitted versus a ton sequestered, and that um, uh, nature-based solutions are gonna lend themselves with that one-to-one -one approach to just being doing creative ac accounting and a shell game and those sorts of things. So I'm wondering how you think um, the Plant Act and nature-based solutions and respond to those critiques. Ed? So uh, try and answer this. Uh, um, I think actually if you look um, into um, uh, the carbon in soil in the in the past uh, hundreds of years, uh, this has there has been enormous amounts of carbon in the soil, and uh, the the major change actually happened in the 19th century when industrialization uh, kicked in, and we have basically now you know, really an exponential curve of that we are losing this, this carbon from the soil. And this is mostly due to our way how we actually have been using the, doing agriculture. And I think uh, we can revert this process. So that means we can put a lot more carbon back into the soil than a one-to-one. -one. So the potential is there. We just, we know uh, we have tools that we developed in the last uh, 30 years or so, and we just have to get get down to work and, and do it. Can I answer that? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, hey, I was wondering. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I won't answer. Okay. You've had a good answer. Yeah, you can. I just was wondering, um, you actually alluded to it before when you were talking about a picture with a bee. Are you working with people that study bees and pollination? So I think that you're you're correct that that um, bees and other insects are really important. Um, they are sort of like the litmus test for some of the agricultural practices that have been uh, influenced uh, the environment. So neonics, I think, have been banned in Europe, um, and they're probably going to be banned in the United States as well. And growers are very concerned about this because they rely on insecticides to keep these um, negative insects in check, although they do have some uh, non-target um, effects that are very, very bad for the environment. Um, so, you know, I think Plant Act is taking into consideration more about climate change in the soil, um, using plants to um, mitigate climate change by carbon sequestration in the soil. But when we talk about the environment and the ecosystem, it will be important to consider insects, uh, protists in the soil, animals as well. It's all a part of the ecosystem. Um, how could we use some of the knowledge which we gain through initiatives like that, for example, to combat desertification, which is one of the topics which came up mostly during our meetings, in that, which I could see in Kenya. Thank you very much. Desertification. Yeah, I, I think that's my, my topic. So, <laughs> so this is actually really something that we are studying quite carefully now, um, and that hasn't been studied carefully, unfortunately. But, and again, we find the same, uh, uh, you know, guys that, that are responsible human beings that strongly influence this by 
basically overpopulation and overpopulation of animals that are eating uh, the plants and destroying so much of the vegetation that finally the, the plants cannot reproduce. Uh, and this is actually how deserts are developing. This is one of the major uh, players in, 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 in desertification. And I think we are actually strongly working also on, on the way how we can revert this process. Not only avoid this process, but re revert this process. This is, it's actually in many cases very simple. You just have to make a big fence around and not let the animals come in anymore. But, <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, you also have to then say, well, the people that come, they, they, they have these herds of animals, so they live on that. So we also have to find solutions to, for that. So it's, a, it's not just a simple uh, uh, plant science or a question. I think we always run in all of these solutions that we develop into more complex uh, issues that we have to look into, into different, different sides. That's what, why we also need actually other people uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the table around the table. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Maybe we can gather. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Hurt, you spoke of taking risks. Uh, I'd like to talk about not taking risks. Uh, each spring and summer in the northern hemisphere, atmospheric CO2 concentrations is, are drawn down by plants on the planet. Uh, and yet, we're committing money from limited treasuries to technological solutions that can't answer the problem. Uh, technological solutions that cost thousands of dollars a ton to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, expressed at, 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 at consistent with the size of the problem, uh, this would exhaust all of global GDP uh, to actually focus our, our, our efforts to, to capture CO2 from the atmosphere using these technological solutions. And yet, we see spring and summer in the northern hemisphere, atmospheric concentration, concentrations drawn down by plants. And so my perspective is, and I think yours, is that what, what needs to happen is that part of the risk has to be to inform uh, the powers that be uh, that the way to solve this problem is in fact with nature-based solutions because we have limited money and what is obvious is that we have limited time. Uh, in, in the fall of this year, in the New York Times Magazine, uh, a, 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 an article at length went into the fact that we, or the, the suggestion that we have 80 years to solve this technologically by an uninformed journalist. Uh, when in fact the biggest opportunity we have to solve the problem is with nature-based solutions. So I am excited to learn about Plant Act, uh, Plant Act, and and I ask you to take risk in terms of telling the powers that be that their allocation of money in things like the Inflation Reduction Act is falsely premised, and that the only solution we have to such a massive problem when you think about 70 parts per million to get back to 350, uh, you're talking about over 140 billion, uh, 40 billion tons of CO2. How do you capture that? And the only answer is to turn the carbon cycle to serve us. And, and so what, what I ask you to do is to think about taking risk politically. Thank you. Okay, I think that was more. I think that was not, 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 not so much as a question, <laughs> but a statement. <laughs> Importantly, perhaps. Well, I think uh, uh, I'm, I want to ask everybody to take a risk, actually, to speak out uh, uh, and to other people, to their, to politicians, and and to their friends and neighbors who trust them and to inform them uh, on, on, on your concern. Um, and I think a big concern for me is that we are uh, on the brink of, of, a, of a climate crisis that this, this makes this, actually, we don't know where this will end. We have no clue where at the end of this 
century we will stand on this planet. And I think um, to pass that on to my, I'm, I'm really concerned with my children uh, and, and, and my grandchildren. And uh, that, that I'm actually passing on a, a world that is not livable anymore in, a, in the sense that it was for, for us. Oh. I'm even more concerned about the young people, you know, because I think that um, they don't really, they're not, in the United States, they're not preparing themselves to deal with these really big problems we're going to have to deal with. And so, you know, we have all these kids who aren't training as scientists, so, so somehow they get turned off. And I think that's because we lose our focus when we, when we turn climate change into a political thing. It has to be somewhat political, of course, because you know everybody has to be on board together because the atmosphere is all mixed up, right? So if somebody on this side, you know, puts up all the stuff and there's a volcano that goes off, the whole planet has to deal with it. And so that's a, that's a, something that we have to all learn to live with and get along better. But I, I, don't, I don't like this lethargy that I see among children, uh, young, young teenagers as a result of the whole COVID thing, you know? So it, these are problems that are bigger than a generation, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna start this project in our lab, but I'm not gonna finish it, and I have to, have, have to find kids that will do it, right? My kids don't wanna do it, I know that, so. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm concerned about my kids and grandchildren too, but I'm actually more worried that people are willing to let the planet go away. You know, human life on the planet, as we know it now. Anyway. So anyway, thank you. Think about that. So. One last question, which is maybe not directed to Henry Matt. Hear me? Can you read? Oh, so actually building off of that, so I was a kid who did not see themselves as a scientist or uh, doing well in math. Basically, what? Eat the mic? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so uh, I have been running a nonprofit the past few years, help people uh, out of poverty, um, and stepped back two months ago to basically go full in on learning biology, plant science, all of that. And I'm part of a community called GenSpace. We're a community-run lab in Brooklyn. Um, I'm learning primer design from a retired systems engineer. I'm learning uh, wet lab work from an architect. It's kind of a, we're using donated equipment, if I didn't say that already, um, from different labs. And it's really like, uh, a lot of people are looking at me like scratching their heads thinking like wow, how, like that's an option like you could do that but it's like extremely difficult um, and so I think yeah I guess you know if we have to act now we can't wait for the children to grow up to you know get the PhDs to then solve problems so if you have all these you know how do you how do you help transition adults I guess into the fight as well is that do you tell them hey you know learn science on your own and figure out how to do transformations uh, do you tell them to go become farmers? Uh, yeah, I guess, you know, there's a funding challenge, but I guess if, the, if there's also a capacity, uh, if there's capacity potential, like where do you, where does that go? What do I tell basically all the other people that are looking at me? Like, my friends, like, you could do this too, what should I tell them? <laughs> okay, take that, Bill Gates. That, that's really cool that you have this sort of program that's available for sort of adult learning. And I think um, continued learning as adults is key and also spreading the message of plants and how plants can help mitigate climate change and to contact, you know, your local or um, state representatives about your concerns about climate change and how you know that plants can play an important role in mitigating climate change and that you support uh, research and science, and I think that's key. Having support from the public is, is a key process um, for our research. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I think this marks the perfect end to our panel discussion. Um, uh, no matter if we're a scientist or a non-scientist in this room, I think we all share a common interest, which is basically to fight climate change and I think that has opened up a really good discussion which hopefully doesn't end because this is the end of the panel but outside downstairs in the lobby now begins the reception so you can all join the reception downstairs 
I ask you to take all your belongings and hope to see you downstairs. Thank you so much.